Um, some of you may be surprised and maybe even disappointed to learn that as a little girl, I didn't dream of raising money for nonprofit arts organizations. <laughs> <laughs> My dream from before I could read was to be a teacher. And when I got to college, I decided that I wanted to be an English professor. So I majored in English, and then I went on to graduate school and did more years and more degrees than is really healthy for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then life took a sudden and abrupt turn in a different direction, and I wound up here. Well, I wound up actually in fundraising. It was years before I would have the pleasure of being here. Um, when, I, when we were told that we would get a chance to speak, I came up with this topic because it lets me bring my two passions together. It lets me talk about narrative and it lets me talk about fundraising. And as I was working on this, I realized my two passions had never been apart. That for the 30 years I've been in fundraising, I have drawn on what I know about literature. And that's one of the reasons that I love my work and it's one of the reasons I would argue that I'm good at it. So I'm going to be drawing on examples from my own work for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're easy to find, and I have permission to use them. <laughs> and secondly, I know the circumstances surrounding them. I can tell you what my intentions were, what the resistance was to what I was doing, and what the results were. And I couldn't tell you that with most of the other examples I could find, if I could even find other examples. In addition to my own experience, I'm going to be drawing on narrative theory and the neuroscience of narrative. So slide one means to suggest how we, <laughs> how we customarily think of narrative. We think of it as a discrete entity that we stick in when we want to lighten the, the ballast of fact. Um, and it can, it can certainly be used that way. Narrative techniques and devices, though, can be used pervasively. Um, they are aspects of stories, not stories in and of themselves. Narrative theorists tell us that there's a difference between story and narrative. Story, they say, is a master plot. Narrative is a mediated master plot. Now, an example of a master plot might be a hero goes on a quest. It's really skeletal, it's bare bones. When it's mediated by a narr narrator, it changes, it gets more detail. If you tell me to tell a story about a hero who's go who goes on a quest, I might tell you about a Marine in Afghanistan who goes in search of a dog that's gotten lost. You might tell me about a medieval knight who goes in, church in search of a golden chalice. It's the same story. It's been mediated differently, depending on who the narrator is. Theorists also believe that we are storytellers by nature, that we automatic, our minds automatically tell stories. Slide two. If we look at this picture, which is a very common one used by narrative theorists, your mind already starts telling the story of what, the, what happened to this ship that's run aground. The arts offer many images that make us want to tell stories too, to make us want to, to create narratives. Here's an example. Next slide. We start telling that story. And another example. There's that. One of my favorite pictures, I have to say. The field of development, though, tends to tell a simple and repetitive story. And again. And again. And again. Stop. There are thousands, maybe millions, of these photographs available. And the story, the master plot here, is giving makes people happy. Only the faces and the backdrops change. The story is so familiar that it can be parodied. Next slide. <laughs> Does anybody recognize the guy on the left? That's Stephen Van Zandt from The Sopranos. Um, also, little Stephen from uh, E Street Band. The, the guy on the right, the man on the right, is a board member at Rutgers University who's given millions. <laughs> Stephen Van Zandt gave the commencement address in 2017. Oh. So there they are. So there's, there's a little parody of the development story. 
Um, it's not hard to be more interesting. Let's, uh, and another one. Imagine those four are donors. It's a much more interesting narrative, if you will. So why aren't we more interesting? Here's my argument. I think development's a conservative field. We don't like to offend people. We've tended to mirror the people that we believe will give us money. And until recently, we've tended to mirror the people working in development. Not only the people, but their values, which I argue would include authority, superiority, objectivity, comprehensive knowledge, and power. This, might, this next slide might be the embodiment of devel development's voice. Hmm. Now, interesting things have been said from behind podiums. <laughs> and sometimes people at podiums try to sound friendly. <laughs> but you can see it's an uphill fight for him. Yeah. You know, he's over here, the hand in the pocket, you know, he's trying, but he's still, we're still looking like that at him. Wouldn't it be interesting to hear from this speaker? <coughs> or maybe this one. Narrative theorists aren't the only ones to explore how narrative works. In the past decade or so, the Department of Defense has funded research into the neuroscience of narrative. They're inter interested in narrative because they want to understand how terrorists recruit young people, and also whether narrative can be used to treat PTSD. Narratives with a dramatic arc take us on a wild neurochemical ride. This is what they found. Uh, we, we alternate between cortisol, known as the stress hormone, and oxytocin, known as the love hormone or the empathy drug. So stress resolution, stress resolution, that's narrative, that's your narrative neurological path. These scientists can predict with 82% accuracy based on a statistical model from neurological data, whether you will contribute to a cause that has just been portrayed in a video. Now notice that when they want to measure success in motivating people, they do it with giving money. So there's this direct and obvious tie-in between the neuroscience and fundraising. Sometimes you can almost feel the chemical rush. I know, I can't watch the Sarah McLaughlin <laughs> ad, uh, but this is one of the shots from that. So chemically speaking, that's how narrative works. But the narrative theorists have more to say. They believe that in addition to creating stories, we fill in the gaps. We might, may not be told what Mr. Bennett's study looks like in Pride and Prejudice, for example, but our minds fill it in. I believe, this is my argument, that our minds fill in an even larger gap, that we recognize narrative devices and are signaled by them to believe that we're getting a narrative. Next one. That's the signal. Mm -hmm. My best evidence comes from an experience I had with a grant proposal. Um, I wrote a proposal to Alcoa for, this was for Audubon, for Audubon, Arizona. And we won the grant, there was a presentation ceremony. And the man from Alcoa asked who'd written the grant, was introduced to me, shook my hands and said, nobody's ever said this before or since, by the way, that was the best grant I've ever read. Wow. It was like reading a novel. Well, you know, if you're a grant writer, you don't, that's not necessarily the biggest compliment in the world, you know? You want it to be like reading a grant. And I had no idea what he meant. So I went back to the grant, and here's how it starts. Describe the needs and objectives to be addressed. Here's my writing. Audubon, Arizona's environmental education programs address two central objectives of its parent organization, National Audubon Society, to foster a culture of conservation in today's youth and to diversify the environmental movement. Because nature is such a powerful teaching tool, we are finding enthusiastic partners in our community schools, particularly those in the poorest, most underserved, but most ethnically diverse districts. Working together, we are able to use outdoor experiences to teach core curricular subjects 
and at the same time instill in our children the love of nature that will make them the conservationists of tomorrow. No novel yet. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's grant. I mean, that's pure grant writing. Here's the second paragraph. For many of today's children, the outdoor experiences we adults enjoy daily growing up and the knowledge we gain from them are a rarity. Wherever they live, even in rural areas, children are now more likely to take lessons, <coughs> join teams, or spend hours in front of a television or a computer than they are to go into their own backyards and play. Wading in a stream, studying the behavior of an ant or a dove, climbing a tree, jumping from one rock to another, these are simple pleasures that many of our children don't know. Mm. And there's another paragraph in this vein. That's where the novel feeling came from. It went on for another 10 pages, in, not in the novel vein, but in the grant writing vein. But because this was early, he experienced the reading as the reading of a novel or something like a novel. Those two paragraphs, the one paragraph even that I read to you had characters, it had action, and above all, it had concrete, specific detail. Oops, that's the novel, I forgot to cue. Novel reading, concrete, oh. specific details. So that, that's my first narrative technique or device. Another narrative device that can be used in fundraising is dialogue. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Here's a panel from a Baltimore Symphony Orchestra brochure that I, cre I didn't draw it, but I, I conceived it. I don't know if you can read the little balloons, but they're all talking, they're not talking to each other, they're talking to people that you can't see and in houses, in office buildings, in buses. And they're all telling little stories about their, what they're doing. Um, tonight we're going to hear the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, my sister's class is going to the BSO. You know, they're all little vignettes here with the, the cartoon illustration. I had to fight like crazy to be allowed to do this. And I was only allowed to do it for lower level donors. Larger donors were presumed to want to hear from him. <laughs> It's a small step from dialogue to monologue, and thus to an important aspect of character, focalization. Next one. Focalization means looking through a lens through which a particular person would see. Um, you see some things, you don't see others. It's, and this is true really even for the man behind the podium. He has his own lens. We just don't recognize it because it's so familiar to us. So focalization is my next technique. And those are two lines from solicitation letters that I wrote. You probably don't recognize my name, but I think you'd know my work. This was a letter that I sent out to major donor prospects over the signature of our production stage manager. It was Arizona Theater Company. And we had just done a play called Fully Committed, which is a one-man show. But it's uh, the, the character in the play is a reservations clerk, if that's the right word, um, at a fancy Manhattan restaurant. And the phone is ringing constantly. Well, it's the stage manager who's ringing the phone. And our stage manager, being a little bit of a ham, created a whole character from the phone ringing. <laughs> and the phone would get impatient if he didn't answer right away. So it would ring, 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 you know. <laughs> And then he, the character would get disgusted and turn away, and the phone would have the last word, go, ring, you know. <laughs> so nobody knew who this guy was, and nobody knew his name, but people had seen the play, and they knew he'd rung the phone. And so that's what the letter was about. It was, you know, people don't see us on stage, but we're doing our part, and that sort of line. The next one, why is the owner of a ball team writing to you about a symphony orchestra, was a letter that we sent out over the name of one of our board members. He was the, ma uh, the majority owner of the Baltimore Orioles. And it was just an interesting juxtaposition. And it let me say how important the symphony was to Baltimore. You know, some people believe the Orioles are a symbol, but the symphony also is, and this is why, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. So when you choose a personal voice like that, a voice full of character, there are limitations 
there are things that a stage manager can't say, believe it or not, at least not in public. Um, you, w you wouldn't expect a stage manager to have full possession of the statistics about the theater company, for example. Um, and the same with the board member who's the owner of a ball team. Thank you. I'm going to run over, but just by a little bit. Um, so my argument is that oftentimes the benefits of choosing a voice like that outweigh the interest factor outweighs what you lose in not being able to tell everything that you know about your organization. For example, we might prefer to hear what she has to say about the ballet, or, next slide, maybe her, or maybe her, rather than always him. <laughs> The last device that I'll discuss is one that I was reminded of in a writing course that I took a few months ago. We were given the assignment in this class to write a six-word obituary. It's a pretty common drill, and so maybe you've done it before. So this was my obituary. Oh, sorry, forgot to show you the gravestones. Obituary <laughs> theme coming up. <laughs> obituary. Marsha planned to write poems, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's my obituary. Um, so the woman sitting next to <laughs> the teacher said, does anybody want to read one of these? And the woman sitting next to me grabbed mine and said, yes, I'd like to read one. <laughs> and she read my obituary. And the teacher got all excited and he said, oh, that's the stranger in town. <laughs> really. And he said the word, but that's the stranger in town. Well, a master plot is a stranger comes to town. And you don't know, is the stranger going to save the mill that's closing? Is the stranger going to shoot the sheriff? We don't know. This is a stranger, you know. And so the word, but he said, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, uh, Marsha planned to write poems, but instead she wrote the great American novel. <laughs> or, but she became a bag lady. <laughs> Either one could still happen. <laughs> so we can use, we can switch now, suspense and surprise in our fundraising writing and speaking, in fact. Uh, the line there, the herd is a white man's museum, was the first line of a very successful grant proposal I wrote. It may have been the biggest annual grant that the herd museum ever got. The herd, by the way, is a museum in Arizona that focuses on Native American arts and cultures. It was not a secret that we, well, they wouldn't want me to say there were no Native Americans on the staff. There were. They, they were mostly in housekeeping. All right. But this was something we didn't say. The Herd is a White Man's Museum. We, you know, we didn't want to be known as that, and yet it was true. And so that was the first line. It was a controversial thing to do. Uh, I had the support of my executive director. The grant writer, the real grant writer, was out of town. So... <laughs> <laughs> And so the grant was about, you know, if you give us this money, we can change the profile of the museum to more to what it should be. And we got the grant, and it was a huge grant. So sometimes surprise and suspense works well. Next slide. This is my last slide. I don't really have an ending because I don't want closure. What I want is for you to go out and use the power and the magic of narrative in whatever you do. Fundraising, it works well, but I'm sure it would work just as well in the fields of your choice. So thank you. Thank you.